Since 2009, the Kepler Space Telescope, which uses the transit method to discover planets, along with other methods like gravitational microlensing, radial velocity, and direct imaging have aided in the discovery of over 5,000 exoplanets. We didn't even know other planets existed outside of our solar system until 1992, only three decades ago, and now, in less than half a lifetime, we've found thousands of planets ranging in sizes, orbits, and composition. Everywhere we've looked for planets, we've found them, and we're only just getting started. We've only searched about one one millionth of our own galaxy, and there are trillions of galaxies. When it comes to exoplanet types and composition, there's a variety of planets. 30% are gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn. These planets contain hydrogen and helium gases above a solid core. There's a wide range of gas giant exoplanets. Some are much larger than Jupiter, and some orbit much closer to the star, creating what's known as a hot Jupiter. These hot Jupiters were easier to detect in the early days of exoplanet discovery because of their size and the pronounced wobble on the star. 35% are Neptune-like. These planets typically have hydrogen and helium-dominated atmospheres with cores of rock, ice, and heavier metals. When these types of planets are far out in orbit, they're ice giants. When they're closer to the sun, they are known as hot Neptunes. 4% are small rocky planets like Earth, Mars, Mercury, and Venus. This percentage may increase as we get better at detecting smaller planets. And finally, 31% are super-Earths, sometimes referred to as mini-Neptunes. Some of these planets may be rocky worlds, water worlds, or Earth-like planets that are covered in a thick, gaseous atmosphere, which we'll explore momentarily. As you can see, these categories are broad and contain several subtypes. Different compositions, orbits, sizes, and densities allow for a very large variety of planets that we're just now beginning to understand. Names like Hot Jupiter, Hot Neptune, and Mini Neptune are a bit of a misnomer. We name them after our own planets because it's all we really know. It's all we can compare them to. When it comes to exoplanets, we're not even crawling yet. We've only just opened our eyes. The most exciting category of exoplanets are the super-Earths. As mentioned, a whopping 31% of discovered exoplanets, 1,592 out of 5,200, are super-Earths, and some of them orbit within their host star's habitable zone. The habitable zone is where the planet's surface is just the right temperature for liquid water. Not too cold, not too hot. It's believed that some of these super-Earths are rocky like Earth, some are gassy like Uranus, and some are a combination of the two. While the gassy ones may not be able to support life as we know it, the rocky super-Earths or water worlds could be teeming with life. They're a priority when it comes to seeking life on another planet outside of our solar system. Every rocky-like planet that we discover in the habitable zone, both big and small, is a candidate for life as we know it. But super-Earths may be even better suited to support life than the small rocky planets like Earth. And what's even more fascinating is that astronomers have already discovered dozens of these super-Earths in the habitable zone. Each one is a new chance to discover alien life or a place for our first interstellar colonies. Why are they great candidates for life? Astrobiologists claim there are several attributes that make life on a planet more likely. Geologically active planets may help to promote biological evolution. An average temperature of approximately 80 degrees Fahrenheit Lots of scattered islands with lots of shallow water areas similar to archipelagos. A thick atmosphere generated by high surface gravity, which could act as a protective blanket from cosmic rays and solar radiation. And finally, a planet that's orbiting a red dwarf or a longer living star because that type of star would have had a longer chance for life to spring up. Ah yes, there are many types of stars as well. O, B, a and F stars make up about 3% of all stars in the Milky Way, but because of their short lifespan, they're not good candidates for life as we know it. G stars, also known as yellow dwarfs, like our Sun, only account for 7% of stars in the Milky Way. Although G stars have a larger habitable zone due to its temperature, life is less likely here because of the star's relatively short lifespan compared to K and M type stars. 
It's obviously possible, as we are orbiting a G-type star, it's just less likely. K-type stars, or orange dwarfs, which are a bit cooler and smaller than our Sun, account for 12% of stars in the Milky Way, and they're the most likely stars to have life due to their long lifespan of 15 billion to 45 billion years. That's up to four and a half times longer than our Sun. And finally, we have M-type stars, also known as red dwarfs. They're even smaller than K-type stars, have the smallest habitable zone, and account for 76% of the stars in our Milky Way. Some say life is not possible here because M dwarfs give off a lot of UV and X-ray radiation, stripping away the possibility for an atmosphere. But others argue that really old M dwarf planets that have developed a secondary atmosphere could sustain life, especially when you consider that these M dwarfs last an incredibly long time, up to 1 trillion years, 100 times longer than our sun. We have a variety of planets, a variety of stars, and when you combine the two, you have an enormous number of possibilities, adding to the mystery of how planetary systems form. Apparently, we're very lucky to be here on this small rocky planet with a thin atmosphere and a rather large moon orbiting a shorter-lived G-type star. We're a bit of an oddity, especially when you consider that the sun's brightness has changed over time, causing deep freezes and boiling hot oceans. Which got me thinking, if Earth-sized rocky planets are not the best suited for life and super-Earths are, it's possible that ETs are more interested in super-Earths that are more likely to have life than a small rocky planet like ours. And that's why we've never been visited. They're not going to waste time on unlikely candidates. Or maybe our rarity is something more. Something divine, perhaps. A thought I'll cover in a future video. Let's get back to super-Earths. Super-Earths could check off some or even all those boxes needed for habitability, which makes them the best candidates to search for life. Let's take a look at some of these super-Earths. Kepler-22b, also known as Kepler Object of Interest 087.01, was the first confirmed Earth-like exoplanet to be discovered in its star's habitable zone. This super-Earth orbits within the habitable zone of a slightly smaller, cooler star than our Sun, Kepler-22. It's 2.4 times Earth's radius, has a mass of 36 Earths, and takes 290 days to orbit its star. Based on computer simulations, it could be covered in water. Glisse 667cc is a potentially rocky super-Earth that orbits within the habitable zone of an M-type star. It has a radius of 1.77 that of Earth, a mass of 3.8 Earths, and takes just 28 days to orbit its star. The three-star system it's contained within would look really beautiful from the planet. Kepler-69c, also known as Kepler Object of Interest 172.02, is likely a rocky super-Earth that orbits within the habitable zone of a slightly smaller star than the Sun, Kepler-69. It's almost twice Earth's radius, has a mass of two Earths, and takes 242 days to orbit its star. There's also Kepler-442b, Kepler-62f, Kepler-186f, Kepler-1229b, and many more. Since we're here, I'll hit on a couple of nearby Earth-sized exoplanets that could potentially be habitable. Because they're so close, they are certainly worth a look. Proxima Centauri b. Although it gets bombarded with a lot of radiation, it's within the star's habitable zone, and at just four light-years away, this is an exciting planet to look into. Rost 128b is only 11 light-years away, within the habitable zone, and likely a rocky planet. It is one of the most Earth-like planets found to date. The TRAPPIST system is an interesting one. In 2017, NASA announced the discovery of seven Earth-sized planets orbiting the star. Four of them are potentially habitable. TRAPPIST-1e, an Earth-sized rocky planet, may have liquid water on the surface, and at 40 light-years away, it's definitely worth a look. Should we colonize super-Earths? Astrobiologists could be correct. Life springs up more often on super-Earths, and they're the most likely candidates for simple and advanced life forms. But I also think that it doesn't necessarily mean that these large planets are better for us humans. Our natural habitat is the best fit for us. Let's not forget that Earth is one giant ecosystem, and we humans are a part of that system. 
we grew out of the earth. Literally, the earth gave birth to humans. Not in the way we think about birth, but in a different way. A birth that took billions of years. As Alan Watts said, a tree apples and the earth peoples. So, in turn, we're a very good fit for earth. We're in a natural symbiosis with earth to some extent. It's not just our life support system. In my humble opinion, earth is the best place for our type of life and we better take care of it. With that said, it's obviously a good idea to escape Earth if it's been compromised by pollution or cataclysmic event, or if we don't need to depend on our environment to survive any longer. Technological advancement could possibly allow for this. In that case then, yes, we should escape to a larger, more habitable planet to ensure our species' survival. But also understand that once we leave our natural environment, we'll evolve to match that new environment, unless we terraform it to match Earth. An environment and the creatures living in it are in a tight organism-environment relationship. Once your environment changes, you change. If you had humans living on Earth and humans living on another planet, Mars for example, their bodies would change drastically over time. Therefore, if we do go to another planet and colonize, there will be different kinds of humans, Martian human and Earth human. And then things could get really interesting. There is one significant catch to living on a super-Earth. The larger the mass of a planet, the harder it is to launch rockets into space due to its gravity. Leaving a super-Earth would be extremely difficult, many times more difficult than leaving Earth. There are many nuances, but let's keep this as simple as possible. The escape velocity from Earth is roughly 11 kilometers per second, meaning we have to go 11 kilometers per second to completely escape the pull of Earth's gravity. That's 25,000 miles per hour. To leave a super-Earth exoplanet like Kepler-20b, which is almost twice the size of Earth and 10 times its mass, you'd need an escape velocity of 27 kilometers per second. While that doesn't sound much more difficult, this new escape velocity requires 100 times more fuel to escape the planet than it would on Earth. This is because rockets carry their own fuel and as the velocity requirement increases, the total rocket mass increases exponentially. Let's make it make sense. This is what we needed to get the James Webb Space Telescope off of Earth. This is how much fuel we would need to launch the James Webb Space Telescope from Kepler-20b. We really are lucky, aren't we? To me, that's the most unsettling part about a mission to a super-Earth. You'd have to make sure you have enough velocity to escape the planet. If not, you could be stuck on a strange planet until you run out of food. Unless you're this guy. If there's advanced life on a planet like this, it would take the inhabitants far longer to reach the stars. They may even be trapped by the planet's gravity. For an alien species, a limitation like this would greatly alter their path of technological advancement. They may forego conventional rocketry for some other kind of technology altogether. Or they may decide not to be a spacefaring species at all. What's next in the search for E.T.? While it's great to speculate about the possibility of life on these super-Earths, we won't know if there's life on the planet until we check its atmosphere for biosignatures, the byproducts of biological processes. Meaning we have to analyze the planet's atmosphere to see if it contains molecules that are associated with life as we know it, such as oxygen and methane or dimethyl sulfide. This is accomplished with spectroscopy. With spectroscopy, we can determine the specific wavelengths of light that planets absorb and emit. Let me explain the basics. When light leaves a star, it emits an almost continuous spectrum of light. This spectrum you see is just the light of a star split into its different components with a prism. We see it as white light. This is just a more detailed breakdown of what white light is, a combination of all colors in the color spectrum. The sun also emits wavelengths outside of the visible light spectrum. The ones we can't see but are around us, like UV, X-ray, and even gamma-ray light. But because most stars emit the bulk of their electromagnetic energy as visible light, we'll just focus on that for now. When the light from the star hits a planet's surface, certain wavelengths of the light are absorbed, and some are emitted into space. Which wavelengths are absorbed and which are emitted depend on the type of material the light is interacting with either in the atmosphere or on the surface of the planet. This is because every element has its own unique spectral fingerprint. 
Consequently, when the light reaches us, we're able to analyze the pattern of missing wavelengths to determine what kind of elements are in the planet's atmosphere or surface. Amazing stuff! We can get really good readings of the planet's atmosphere using the transit spectroscopy method. As a planet passes in front of a star, light travels from the star through the atmosphere, if there is one, and directly to us. By analyzing the spectra, we can determine, to some degree, the chemical composition of the atmosphere. In the last 30 years, we've gone from not knowing other planets existed to finding a large number of potentially habitable planets. This number will only continue to grow through the use of existing missions like Hubble, TESS, Spitzer Space Telescope, and newer missions like the James Webb Space Telescope, PLATO, Ariel, the 39-meter Extremely Large Telescope, the 30-meter Telescope, and the 25.4-meter Giant Magellan Telescope, which will be four times more powerful than the JWST. That one will be coming online closer to 2030. While my bet is on super-Earths because of their super-habitability, I believe that life is much more flexible and dynamic than we realize. As they say, life finds a way. In my opinion, there's a very good chance that life exists on smaller, rocky-sized planets like ours. I mean, we made it. And life also exists on these super-Earths, and maybe even on Neptune-like planets that are in the habitable zone because different pressures might enable different chemistry, or life as we don't know it, we simply don't know. Eventually, we'll find life, and when we do, it will change the very understanding of what we are and how we define ourselves. I'll get into that in the next video. Thanks for watching and drop a like if you enjoyed it.